May I start by saying that it's a great privilege for me to be here today as the chair of the University of London Center of African Studies at SOAS, University of London. I'm here representing both the Center of African Studies and SOAS University of London at this unique joint centenary Javavu lecture to commemorate the centenaries of our two esteemed universities, the University of Fort Hare and SOAS University of London. Both universities were established in 1916, one in South Africa and the other in London. Our two universities have both come a very long way in the past 100 years, making major contributions to human development in Africa through education and high quality research that has and continues to have considerable positive impact on the continent, but also globally. As the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, SOAS prides itself as the only institution of higher education in Europe that specifically specializes in the study of Africa, Asia, and the Near and Middle East. At SOAS, we have the largest concentration of experts on Africa outside Africa, covering a wide range of disciplines from politics to development, governance, law, languages and cultures, arts and music, history and economics, anthropology and religion, amongst others. We have also welcomed students from all over Africa throughout our history. Our notable African alumni include the distinguished African-American singer, actor, and leading campaigner against racism, Paul Robeson, who studied Swahili and phonetics at SOAS in 1934. Others include Madame Luisa Diaz Diego, former Prime Minister of Mozambique, late Dr. John Atamils, former President of Ghana, Justice Muhammad Idris Kutibi, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. And from South Africa, we can mention, amongst others, Mr. Letizia Kayago, the Governor of South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Graham Muleke, late Joseph Matthews, the son of Z. Z. K. Matthews, Professor Lawyer Anthropologist and an Anthropologist at Fortier University, who obtained an MA in history in 1965 at SOAS, while serving as the ANC representative in its London office. We also have on our list of South African uh, uh, alumni, Mpo Franklin Paxter, the former mayor of Johannesburg, and Professor Sidney Mutamadi of the University of Johannesburg. Through our teaching and research on Africa, we have over the years been asking challenging questions about the big issues facing not just Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, but about our world generally. We ask questions about equality, democracy, governance, access to water and food, about rights to education, about culture, religion, society, languages, art, and music. Asking questions is fundamental to everything we do at SOAS. For our centenary celebrations, we have launched a new global campaign on questions worth asking for the next 100 years in relation to our different regions of specialization. For Africa, we have chosen the question, how can Africa play the 21st century as the big question worth asking? At the beginning of this century, in April 2000, the World Bank released a report on Africa titled, Can Africa Play the 21st Century? Which is a question of whether we believe that with the abundant human and natural resources with which Africa is endowed, it can certainly play the 21st century. So the question should not be whether, but how. And this is why we have chosen, how can Africa play the 21st century as the big question worth asking now. 
our academics and students across our different disciplines will be asking this big question and other sub-questions under it into our next centenary. As a university, we have committed to strengthen our engagement with Africa into the next centenary of SOAS. This joint centenary Jababu lecture is a significant step in that regard. And we hope that this will be the beginning of bigger collaborations with the University of Hotel in our journeys towards our next centenaries. We perceive that the University of Hotel shares many things in common with SOAS University of London, including the strong commitment to Africa. It is interesting to note, however, that the bridge that links the University of Hotel and SOAS University of London was actually built before the establishment of the two universities. In the student and acad academic life of the late Professor Davidson Don Tango Jababu, the great South African academic and writer, <coughs> DBT, as he was popularly known, attended the University College London between 1906 and 1912, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in English. He returned to South Africa in 1914 and was appointed as a founding faculty member and the first black academic member of staff at the University of Hotel in 1915, prior to the opening of the university in 1916. His reputation grew as an academic and writer at the University of Hotel until his retirement as professor of Bantu language in 1944, having taught here for about 30 years. Rhodes University conferred him with a honorary doctorate degree in 1954. Amongst his notable works were The Black Problem published in 1920 and The Segregation Fallacy and Other Papers published in 1928. It is a recognition of this great man and his role as the foundation bridge between our two universities that this joint centenary lecture is named the Jabalpur <coughs> Lecture. And we are so honored to have another great African scholar, academic and writer, Professor Njabulo Ndebele, to deliver this collaborative lecture. I must in that regard acknowledge the role of Canon Collins Educational and Legal Assistance Trust in brokering this collaborative joint event. <coughs> so as partners with Canon Collins Trust on different events and scholarships relating to Southern Africa, and we hope to continue doing so as part of our continued engagement with Africa and collaboration with the University of Forte into the future. Actually, in April this year, to next month, we will be hosting the Oliver Tambo Lecture in London, organized by the South African High Commission. Oliver Tambo himself was an alumni of the uh, Forte University here at one point. Therefore, we believe that the University of, uh, SOAS University of London and the University of Forte have so much in common in relation to our engagement with Africa and in relation to contributing to the development of the continent. <coughs> to conclude, I would like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Kai Easton, who represents Canon Collins Trust at SOAS, for initiating this collaboration and linkage. I would also thank my colleague, Ms. Angelica Bashira, African Studies, for overseeing all the administrative arrangements on our side. Finally, I must also thank the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hotel and our colleagues here, especially Professor Patrick Osode of the Faculty of Law and Ms. Melissa Manambile of the International Affairs Office for the kind hospitality and collegiality accorded us since our arrival here. We hope that this collaboration will move both universities forward to change the face of Africa for the better. Thank you all very much for your attention.
it is always incredible to uh, be able to learn at the commitment of an institution to move into nations of the world and be able to uh, develop, establish, and then release leaders, just as the University of Fort Harris, so is the University of London, to transform those nations and to create within them the desire to see lifelong learners released. So I'm, I'm very excited to have heard and, and learned of all the things that you're doing. Thank you so much. Uh, we now have the pleasure of having uh, Callum Collins uh, a scholar, Douglas Sayanin, who's going to join us now at the podium and uh, come up and tell us more about this. Thank you. Centenary Scholarship offered by Canon College. On behalf of Canon College Trust beneficiaries, thank you for continuing to support and encourage higher education. Your kindness and generosity is greatly appreciated. It is my hope to serve in a political position where sometimes in the future I might have even where sometimes in the future where I might have even more an ability to help less fortune and underprivileged to attain education in the name of characters. <coughs> Beyond the substantial financial relief, the scholarship has created a fertile ground to network with various common college partner organizations, alumni and fellow scholars. Through these networks, as scholars, we've been exposed to insightful views on different schools of thought, elevating our understanding of key concepts regarding the notion of social justice. Without further ado, let me turn to the historian and the latter mission between Forte and Canon Collins Trust. Please forgive me, sometimes as a lawyer, I blind find myself speaking in Latin, and lawyers will understand why. <laughs> Canon Collins Trust, something that has lived with me for a long time. My father, who was also an, education, an educationist, he was a great reader of books, a lover of art. And he also, uh, in his reading, I got to discover some things that your parents don't want you to see. But when you have time, you rummage through boxes and things, and then you find a treasure that you never thought existed. The treasure that I found was in my father's garage, in a wooden box in which a, a treasure trove, a treasure trove of banned books was dis I discovered. Because if uh, the police or were had discovered those books, he would have been in trouble. But nothing stops young people from confronting trouble. So I read those books, uh, not caring whether I was discovered or not. But subsequently, it was a pleasure to share the experience. I virtually read them. So I'm making connections through time. Two of the books that I discovered, which I have read again recently with great pleasure. One, drawn in color. 
to the Oka people, written by Nuri Jabab, whose relatives are here today. What a wonderful coincidence that this has happened, and I'm able to see the people that are connected to one of South Africa's most distinguished authors. When you read the, the, the Oka people, for example, who were coming from Islam, from Islam to Fort Hare yesterday, and, and we saw murderous drift, middle, middle drift. And she spends uh, the first part of that book describing in great detail when you read her interactions with her father, the description of the natural environment, family relationships, she describes everything with so much detail that you are actually there. When she talks about her father, she talks about the visit to Fort Hare. As we entered the gates of Fort Hare, I kept on saying, where would she have gone when she visited the Zamanis one day uh, on this campus? And she describes going to do to, to shopping uh, at, the, at Alice and describes what it is like to interact with people in the shops. And I kept on thinking to myself as we entered, where is that shop? I wonder if it is still there. And so it is that writers that will connect us in this way. And I'm so grateful and honored to see Nomi Tobago's relatives here and also that you have been chosen to speak today at the inaugural lecture of the first of, of the, in, in honor of the Jabbas. A hundred years of history is a theme of time. That is partly what my talk is about today. And so I begin. And I begin this lecture by dedicating it to four men and their families. Here is who they are. Mr. Beginjela Moelase, Mr. Kenwan Moelase, Mr. Mde Sikakan, and Mr. Ndoda Mugog. You may not have heard of them until now. I too did not know a thing about them until I unexpectedly came across Mr. Kaya S. Sitores' inspired writing about them and their demise. In his account, Mr. Sitore, an academic at the University of the Witwatersrand, combines academic research with the imaginative, imaginative sensibility of literary art of the kind that Noni Jabal was so good at. Sitore's approach enables him to tell a story of our times. In that story, we can discern on the large canvas of history, sweeping events that have affected millions of people in their various national contexts, such as in South Africa. And from time to time, people get swept into conflicts with global dimensions far beyond their imaginations. Such was the impact of the First and Second World Wars of the 20th century. And before them, before colonialism, we had a pre-colonial large canvas, sort of drama of various kinds. Events of this nature capture our attention almost totally because of their telescopic dimensions. At the same time as he draws our attention to the wide canvas, Sitori is also able to zero in on the detail of experience to let us have a look with something close to graphic insight into the intimate, microscopic, personal dilemmas of individuals within their families 
their interactions with their neighbors, with the natural world, and the institutions created by humans around them, such as schools, churches, clinics, stores, and all sorts of institutions. I can contemplate today then a story that is a minute detail against the scale of its replicability across the vast South African landscape, affecting millions of people over time. It is a story in which social intimacies between people sharing a local close geographic space are simultaneously shattered and broken by habitual actions which they deploy to keep one another at bay, despite the necessity before them for close interaction. Such distancing behavior has long become the social logic that drives how power and powerlessness among them interact continuously. To the benefit of one over the detriment of the other. Over time, mistrust and mutual suspicions define their interactions, describing what is possible or not possible. I contemplate with you then the relationship between a well-renowned school in the Midlands of Natal on the one hand, and on the other, a known citizen denizens of a certain kind who have subsisted in the shadows of the greatness of their vicinity. This story came into my life one day through the internet. One moment there was no story, story to speak of. The next moment there it was. I sense therefore a profound democracy in this unexpected encounter. It sets aside any suspicions of willful intent on my part that I could be laden with suspicious motives. It enabled me to contemplate the story with curiosity, such as young people have at believe today, and the urge to take on a journey wherever it would take me. So, to enter the website of Hilton College, private school for boys, in the Midlands of Kwazulu-Natal, is to experience something close to an epiphany. You encounter the very sense and essence of the education embodied in an institution. Three website screens on their website let you into what this school is all about. This school you, you read is deeply traditional, reflect, refreshingly contemporary. One. Two, this school has a plan for each Hilton boy. Three, and this school is a world-class camp. The pristine whiteness of its buildings across the estate is accentuated by the lush surroundings of green, manicured lawns, fields, and heavily leaved trees. It is beautiful. But Hilton College has a secret. That life never heralded as part of its greatness, has subsisted in the shadows in which the four men we have already met and their invisible families have lived for some eight decades in their lives. On the 24th of February of January this year, 2017, Ndeng Skakan turned 87. On the 21st, of March 2017, Human Rights Day, Begin Hela Moelase turned 86 years old. 
of the four men of our dedication, these two are still alive. But catastrophe looms before them as they come down in their lives, ticks by, and the horizon gets closer and closer as they get closer to the end of their lives. Their deaths, it seems, according to Sertorius' account, might just solve a niggling land issue for Hilton College. While they are staying alive, they prolong the burden of its complications. Here is a summary of events related to this reflection. As a consequence of the British conquest of Kozulu Natal, and the forcible dispossession of conquered peoples. The descendants of our four men and their families, and many other families in their communal locality, lost to Hilton Farm, and ultimately to Hilton College, the land on which they had lived. That was early in the 1880s. In the series of military and political developments and in unfolding administration of conquest by the British government since the beginning of the 19th century, we have learned from scholars such as Colin Bundy, among others, about the dispossession, displacement, dislocation, and dispersal of people forced by the British conqueror to become wage laborers in towns and cities, sharecroppers, or labor tenants on white farms, often on the very land that was taken away from them. It was against the legacy of such historical context that the relationship between Hilton College and those who were to live in its shadows was established and has evolved. Sitoria writes, and I quote from him, somewhat extensively. When Hilton College was established within the Hilton Farm in 1822, Muelas's parents and great-grandparents formed part of the greater workforce within the farm, some of whom were absorbed into the workforce of the college. What was particularly unique about this arrangement is that the black workers who had lived on the farm before it was acquired by the individuals who eventually turned it into Hilton College, had an arrangement whereby they had to work for free in exchange for living space, the right to graze, the right to have cattle. In this arrangement, the farm or college could simply issue an instruction to an individual for them to come to work at any time, at any point, for no compensation. And for the longest time, both the college and the families operated under this arrangement. End of quote. Even the declarations of Nelson Mandela in a speech he delivered at Hilton College in 1996, when he said, that his government would ensure that the rights of labor tenants would be recognized and they would be given ownership to the land they had occupied for generations. That did not prevent what eventually was to happen. In the face of Mandela's assurances, elsewhere in South Africa, many farmers began to evict from their farms, laborers, who had lived there long enough to be at home and to be protected by the legislation that was coming. But Hilton did not do anything so crass. The nature, but the nature of arrangements and incentives between Hilton College and the families that encouraged many families around the college to relocate to Howick a nearby town is a story that still has to be told and followed up by young researchers who are in here 
to find out more about that part. But the closure Hilton, of the closure of Hilton Intermediate School, very interesting school, whose purpose was created in order to educate the children of the workers based on the estate, will not have made things easy for the four families that decided to remain on the estate. To ensure their rights, they were later to submit their land claims in terms of the Labor Tenants Act of 1996, the year of the adoption of the new South African Constitution. Interesting things then seem to come together. This, when this happened, this was 83 years after the Native Lands Act of 19 June 1913, by which hundreds of thousands of Africans were dispossessed of their lands by the Union government in the collusion of the British government and which became as South Africans who lost their land who became a sole right he was to write pariahs in the land of their beds. But the travels of our men and their families were not about to end. Their land claim applications were among 19,000 claims submitted in 2001. As of now, 16 years later, the land claims court has not only not deliberated on the claims, but the relevant department of rural development and land reform, according to Citroen, lost or misplaced most of the 19,000 claims that were submitted by the families on time. They simply, quite simply, do not know what happened to the documents. And for those documents which are still around, they seem to be unable to remember what the documents are all about. The big issue is not that the department has lost the Hilton case, but rather the reality that the department does not intend on processing the claim. From 2001 to 2013, the Hilton families wrote repeatedly to the department to ask them to send to, to send his claims to the land claims court. What a moment delay it could turn out to be to settle a legal issue by default through the death of the claimants. But let us have hope. Two days after this lecture, on the 31st of March, the next two days, Following an instruction from the Land Claims Court, the Minister of Rural Development and Land Reform has to appoint a special master to facilitate the labor claimants' land claims process. We wait to see what the ANC government will do two days from now. We will, will it come to the aid of the dispossessed or will it allow the logic of colonial dispossession to continue to run its course 23 years into the new constitutional democracy. We wait to see how 217 years of history in the locality of an estate in the Midlands of Brazil Natal will play itself out. For now, Find a spot in your mind to pack this story that I've shared with you for a while and consider the moment when South Africans, all of them equally enfranchised, adopted the Constitution in 1996. I will invite you once again towards the end to think of the, 30, of the 31st of March what is going to happen in the next two days on this matter.
when our constitution was adopted in 1996, it was a heady moment. The consultation process that had led to this historic occasion was vast and in its encompassing reach. The process had been designed to make as good as the outcomes that were intended. All of us were consulted, were consulted in some way or other. The broad national consensus behind the adoption of the constitution, therefore, was an indication that South Africans strongly desired to have something like a constitution, something uh, to be a solemn commitment that guided, signaled the beginning of a new phase in history. On the 6th of April, 2017, Five days after the Minister of Rural and Land Reform will have decided on the matter of the special master in the pending land claims, note these dates. It will be 344 years that John Van Rick landed on the Cape of Good Hope to begin a phase of history that our Constitution in 1966, 344 years earlier, later, was intended to formally bring to an end. This Constitution then moved and set a framework for new relationships among South Africans. These would be based on an agreed set of fundamental values and principles from which it would be derived the rights, the privileges, the benefits, the duties, and responsibilities of the shared citizenship of all of us in here and beyond. But a question, the kind that needed to be thought and the time in which to think that the question needs to be answered and always begs to be asked. How do South Africans begin to live together as people on the basis of a new document, no matter how aspirational or inspirational it was, when for over 150 years, they have known one another largely across the crude binary simplifications of master and servant, taskmaster and laborer, ruler and the ruled, the civilized and the uncivilized, the literate and the illiterate, the educated and the ignorant. Put all these people in one room of a country and say, live together now, we have a new constitution. Within this crude world of binary simplifications, relationships between political and economic groups were fundamentally transactional in a manipulated kind of way, uh, such that the direction of power and influence was predetermined in one way, from powerful whites in control and powerful blacks under control. And it, at this point, I'd like to say to you that each time I use the word white or black in relation to people, imagine that I have put quotation marks around them. Because I don't accept anymore the use of these words to refer to, refer to people. We are much more than what we have been taught to think we do black. And that is the basis on which I adopted this practice. Imagine the quote unquote around black, white, or whatever in reference to people. Having to know one another, a people without predetermined identities in a new constitutional democracy, and to become socially, politically, economically, culturally welded into a new national community was one desirable, a condition that could not simply be declared to be. It needed 
a great deal of work. What was that work sufficiently and rigorously identified by all of us by the time the Constitution was adopted? How would it be undertaken? Exactly how? And with what? And by what means? And over what period of time would, was it intended to yield its results in ways reputable far into the distant future? Another question needs to be asked. On which segment of the broad South African population would the burden of agency and initiative fall in the bringing about of a new society? Who of all these people who are caught in these binary simplifications is going to do this to, to take the leadership? Who? Was this question sufficiently asked? The Brazilian educator of my, my undergraduate youth, I guess, Paulo Freire, in his seminal book, Pedagogy of Progress, answered this last question rather definitively. Those who embark on a, on a self-liberation cause, those generations of struggling analysis that uh, Professor Jabula Ndelele has delivered. But let me try. Firstly, I would like to extend a word of thanks to our program director and to all those who have organized this event. On behalf of the University of Forte, of management of the university, I sincerely thank you for the hard work that you put into the task. I would also like to thank the members of the Jabab family for agreeing to that we should uh, introduce this event in our calendar of events at the University of Forte. We thank you very much for giving your blessing. Professor Dr. Mr. Ntagula who, Ntagula, who is our Deputy Chair of Council, my sincere thanks to you for making the time. I know you, you run a very busy schedule, and those other council members who are here present today. Professor Padere and his colleagues from SOAS, and to those who represent the Canon, Canon Collins Educational and Legal Assistance Trust. Incidentally, back in 1989, when I was about to embark on my fieldwork for my PhD research, I was honored to be awarded a scholarship through the Canon College Trust, which also in those days also worked in conjunction with an institution that was called the Africa Educational Trust. At the time I was doing my PhD at the University of Hull in the United Kingdom, which I understand uh, is now the cultural capital of that country something that pleases me very much. I did, of course, obtain my PhD the following year, 1990. So, yes, it is true, I do look much younger <laughs> than my actual age. It was 1990, it was, what, 20, 26 years ago? Almost 27 years ago. 
the registrar, Professor Somniso, uh, what can I say? I mean, you are the chief whip. You know, when it comes to managing and directing such operations, and indeed, once again, we are pleased to see that this one as well has uh, been implemented efficiently. President of the SRC, our sincere thanks go to you. Uh, we are aware that uh, Professor Nevele, uh, I think we should mention this as, as well as to the other guests that uh, we are in a, in, in a very short recess, which is our re uh, winter recess at the moment. So many of our students are not with us uh, right now. But I can see that the SFC president uh, did manage to coordinate efforts sufficiently enough for us to have a significant presence of those students who have remained and uh, have not gone home during this short vacation. So thank you very much for that. To the teams and academics of the institution, thank you again also for gracing this occasion. I understand that we have in our midst Professor M.G. Matoma Huru, who is representing Walter Sulu University. Now, I would like to make a special word of thanks to Professor Ndebel. You know, Prof, I'm a scholar of the land question in South Africa. Perhaps not one of those who might be regarded as very distinguished scholars, because we did have spent a fair amount of my career doing other things. Uh, I've delved into the civil service, I've delved into the private sector, but now I'm back in academia, in academia and trying very hard to revive my scholarship. So when you spoke so eloquently about the length issue that relates to Hilton College, I started thinking and imagining that, you know, that is but a microcosm of something which is being replicated across the length and breadth of our country. We have so many thousands of families and claimants who are waiting to see justice finally being done. You spoke of what happened to those who are dispossessed of the land that is now where Hilton College stands, back in the 1880s. But we saw from there, I think our country saw from there, a seamless continuum of dispossession, which straddled both what some referred to as the pre-1913 period and went beyond 1913. And so again, the question arises, why is it that in our country we decided to impose, literally impose, this cut off date of 1913? Because had that not happened, the Hilton claimants perhaps would not be claiming as labor tenants, but they would be claiming as the original owners of the land. Because they owned the land before they were dispossessed in the 1880s. But if their claim is regarded as, is based on this cutoff date of 1913, then the historical aspect of their claim would not be recognized only the more contemporary one 
where they became, after which they became late, so called labor tenants. Prof, I really was fascinated by your articulation around the concept of the binary simplifications that we are confronted with in our country. Indeed, when you cite Paulo Freire, that touched the nerve. And I recalled a particular quotation from that great scholar, which uh, we used to rehash our own days of, of youth at university. Where Paulo Freire says, the historical and ontological vocation of the oppressed is to become more fully human. In fact, that is precisely, or to a very large extent, the gist of your lecture today. Then there is this Halabalu that has been sparked by a tweet by one Mrs. Helen Zille. According to her, the slogan should be, apartheid is dead, long live colonialism. It is truly an obnoxious thing to say. But Prof, I'm not summarizing your speech, I'm just reflecting on some of the points that uh, you highlighted. So, there are so many other issues which I'm sure many of us will take home with, our, with us and which will enrich our understanding of the challenges that our country faces as well as the ways and means that need to be adopted to address them. For example, this whole point, Prof, that you make about a criminally syndicated government project whose aim is to abort the vision of our Constitution. Another one is where you refer to, to us, the end of your address, anti-tribalism. How do we ensure that we consolidate and jealously guard the gains that were made since 1912 by our people in going away with a cancer of tribalism, which more often than not takes other mutations such as xenophobia and so on and so forth. How do we guard against that? So with having said all that, Prof, I really thank you most sincerely for having graced our institution today and for having shared with us such profound and indeed highly educate, ed, educational thoughts and analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs>